Good morning, everyone. Yeah. What's so good about it? Hey. Can you hear me? Hello? I can hear you, Autumn. Oh, thank you. <laughs> like, what's going on? He's ignoring me. Unless he can't hear us. Professor Younger, can you hear us? Anyone have any questions before we get started? I don't think it's a new day, can. starting chapter seven. Can, Excuse can me, start chapter 13. Can, can you, you hear, hear us? us? Hello? Hello. <laughs> you can't hear us? Are you I think you're muted? No. Is your microphone not working no. right? You can't hear we me? Can't. You can't Whoa. you can't hear us. Okay. It does. It says I'm not muted. Can you hear us? But y'all can't hear me. Everybody having that problem? That's weird. We can't hear computer you. Computer audio. I wonder. Hold on a second. Let me see if my mom borrowed my computer. Hold on. Midterm Wednesday. Uh, yeah, the midterms ah. on Wednesday. Thank you. Can y'all hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. We've we we've always been able to hear you. Okay, but I couldn't hear y'all. Yeah, you couldn't hear us. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Well, that makes me feel a little better, you know, on the that, that's, uh, line of crazy. I guess that makes me right. feel. A <laughs> At least yeah, you missed a ton of salt. My computer and was doing something, but she evidently turned off the microphone, so that's why I couldn't uh, hear you guys. But I got your signal. <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm turning off my video you guys get water again all right sounds awesome bless you the lord has a big one blow your he headphones off thank you <laughs> all right so as i was saying we are uh going to start chapter 13 today uh probably will finish it not really positive uh the what i'm going to do is this time next uh this time on Wednesday will be your actual uh, midterm, and that's the respondents midterm. Uh, you hopefully have all attempted to take the respondents practice test so you can make sure your stuff works with it. That's why I put it up last week. I and have then, not. Oh, well, you might want to do that. So make sure everything works. And I then, will be like doing, said, doing that during tomorrow. class time. You will do this. Uh, you will take this test instead of coming to class. I, I have the ability uh, to look in on you while you're taking your test, so just be aware of that. Uh, you'll be monitored, of course, by video. There's very special instructions at the beginning of the respondents practice test, and those are more or less the same instructions at the beginning of the regular test. That being said, I think I'm going to give you a whole hour and 15 minutes to take the test. Anybody and how many how many questions are there do you know i think i made it 40 if i remember correctly okay so yeah it's, it's pretty doable uh 40 40 questions you get an hour and 15 minutes most people finish in about 25 30. and most most of the grades are usually pretty good the grades are le lesser on this one because you're not allowed to look up stuff not allowed to have notes not allowed to have your book uh all that good stuff uh, you are allowed to have that one equation sheet that I told you about, but it can only have the equations without the names of the equations. And I gave you very specific equations you should have. So make sure you do those. You can let, check on the last uh, lecture if you want to remind yourself what that list is. But it's basically Kepler's third law, uh, the simple wave equation, which v, is V equals F times lambda, which you can make in that circle. Uh, w equals MG, which you can make in that circle. And F equals MA, which you can make in that circle. That's pretty much the only real equations you're using, and I doubt you'll even use those last two. But you should expect to know Kepler's third law, be able to solve that for T or for A. 
at or P or A, whichever one your book uses, as well as you should be able to use the velocity equals frequency times the wavelength to tell me the wavelength of a radio station, if it's AM or FM, or uh, maybe we'll tell me the velocity of a wave. Yes. We will be allowed to have a, a TI-130 with us, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I don't make any stipulations on the calculators. Cool. Um, and then will we have lab today? Yes, we will have lab today. Uh, that will be another chance for you to ask me any questions you might have because it's going to be a very short lab. I have a dentist appointment that I get to all the way in Suffolk. So uh, that should fixed? be over pretty quickly. Getting your tooth fixed? Uh, supposedly, they're going to check, make sure everything works. If everything works, they're going to go ahead and take a mold and uh, send off for my tooth to be made. So I'll be looking like a regular person. I'm still waiting for a crown. Um, professor? Yes. Would you say that a good study guide for the midterm would be our previous tests on Canvas? Uh, especially for the final, yes. Uh, but for the mid uh, midterm, pretty much. I mean, I, I, I don't use as many from the previous tests, except for there's a huge overlap between the previous tests and the practice tests. Uh, so really the best thing is the practice test. I would take that respondus version like one time just to make sure your respondus stuff works. But just take that other one over and over and you're probably in your best place because that that sort of is a cumulative review anyways of chapters one through six. But always, you know, that's always a good thing in most classes is to review old tests. Uh, so you, you should y'all can still open up your tests that you've had in the past, right? Your online tests. Yeah. Um, so the the midterm, is that on everything we've learned so far or is that just yes. chapters five? Because the thing says just chapters five and six. Yeah, it's all my tests are comprehensive, but it's mostly focused on five and six. This one, uh, this midterm and the final are even more so uh, focused on previous chapters plus five and six. Whereas, you know, chapter <laughs> test two was on three and four and it was mostly three and four and a little bit of one and two. This one's probably still mostly five and six, but a whole lot of one, two, three, and four. Cause like I said, it is supposed to be like a you midterm. You shove a few questions in there. Go for it. You shove a few questions in there, nothing too big. Yeah, it's not, yeah, I don't try to pick out the hardest things, but you know, you should expect to know how the stars move uh, from, you know, one hour to the next or one day to the next or one sidereal day to the next uh, in each of the, you know, directions, whether it be to the right, to the left, above or below Polaris, or whether it be to the east, the west or the south. Uh, you should know your moon phase questions. Uh, those velocity calculations, there's usually at least one or two in there. Uh, Kepler's third law, there's usually one or two in there. And yes, but uh, uh, Autumn's steering you right. It's not, it's not hugely. I just don't want you to think it's as low on the previous stuff as the previous tests. And then uh, I think Kimberly has a question. Yes, Kimberly, I'm sorry. I saw your hand now. No worries. Uh, I was wondering about the reflection questions. Did you want us to do all 50 for each chapter? Or... Uh, as many as you wish to do, the more points you get. So, okay. Like some chapters I have five sets and then some chapters I have no sets, but I told everybody they could just uh, render the learning goals for each chapter into a question form and answer that in, in long sentence paragraph form. And that would count for the chapters that I don't have question questions on. Are you still, and, oh, sorry, Kimberly, go ahead. Yeah, I, was, I was just wondering if they were required or if they were extra credit. They're not, I mean, nothing's really required other than your tests and your homeworks. The, the big thing is you have to have a minimum number of Astro points. Uh, you can get that by attending class every day and taking your practice tests every time. Uh, and I think maybe one or two sets of reflection questions that will get you up to the minimum number. But the more you have, the more chance you have of improving your score. As you'll see, once the midterm happens, that's a little harder test and your test grades will, you know, show that that's a little harder. And when that happens, you'll think, oh, well, maybe I better do some master points. So, the, yeah, so sure. the Astro points will definitely okay. help our final grade if we're kind of slacking on tests. Uh, that's the point of it, yes. But okay. you have to meet the, that criteria, like 2,500 points to get three, oh. uh, 3,000 to get five, and 3,500 to get uh, seven points. Are, okay. you, are you still taking um, paragraphs on news articles and movies as yes. Astro points? Okay. Yes. All those, the only things I think I'm not doing 
uh, is that constellation quiz and that uh, you recite to me the constellations in alphabetical order, correctly spelled and all that stuff. That I, I can't really do over the interweb. So not not easily without, you know, someone cheating or something. <laughs> yeah, I can just read the list and, you know. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the list is there. You can do all that and you just turn them in in that location where it says turn in astro points here. And like I said, all even the, including the chapters that I actually do have uh, reflection questions, you can even do more by putting in the learning goals in question form and then answer them in you know sentence slash paragraph form. I do expect you know robust answers, not like yes. Okay, <laughs> so give me some context. Yes, it's easy. You know here. Yeah. <laughs> so, anybody else have any questions? All right, well, I'm certain you guys are all going to rock the midterm. Uh, that's the way it goes, because you guys are cool. Unlike that other class I got, they're horrible. I don't like them at all. No, not really. I'm, not, I'm lying. And do you say that to all your classes? I do. I do all, every one of them. <laughs> I also do a great impression of Bubbles. I'm a bunch of people, my kitties. <laughs> y'all should watch Trailer Park Boys. It's just really horrible, but it's great. I love wow. it. I, I love it. Trailer Park Boys. It'd be great. <laughs> But I was supposed to feed my kitties. <laughs> All right, well, let's get started on the material before I do any more bad impressions. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen with you. I'm actually using the textbooks uh, PowerPoint for this one because it's got some really good photos and I haven't had time to, to make one myself. So I'm gonna go with this and I think you will all enjoy it to some extent. I mean, as much as you can for you know being in a class on a Monday morning. So now, well, that's weird. It just You're stopped not sharing. Yeah, it started and then it stopped. Let's see what's going on now. Okay, now it looks like it's sharing. Nope, there's no line around it. You do not see it. Oh, there you go. Okay. Y'all see it now? We can see it, yes. Okay, cool. We see we see your uh your chapter seven. Yes, yes. Oh, Definitely not the one I meant. <laughs> Jesus, I have all the time to open it ahead of time. Let's do file. Let's see if it'll let me go this it, way. It's Monday, so yeah, it's fine. You have that excuse. Yeah, I, and I had, you know, I literally got up two hours early to make sure I did this right, but here we are. Now I you're not autumn. even sharing video. Autumn's the problem, to be honest with you. I am. I'm always the problem. Just uh, and, blame and it all on me. <laughs> It's not uh, my fault. That and politics, that's the problem. Okay, so we're Don't 132. We jump from chapter 7 to chapter 13. That means y'all probably want to see chapter 13. I am missing chapters 15 and 16, so I got to find those. I'm going to kill that little sucker. And I think somebody just tried to come in. I got to let them in too. I'm gonna kill you. You go away now. Gotcha. Enable editing, yes. So I don't like that bar going across the top. Okay, now I'm going to do share screen. Yep, Abigail's here. Okay, so let's try sharing the screen once again. And let's see if we get chapter 13 this time. It'll be a miracle. It's a Monday miracle. All right, so it looks like Good we got job. the right one. Yes. Okay, now if I can make it full screen, we'll be golden. Okay, so this chapter is called Taking the Measure of the Stars. Uh, we, we, One of the hardest things we can do in astronomy is actually take the measure, in other words, measure the distance to stars. Uh, there's, there's something we call like the ladder of distance that we sort of use. And basically, we can get distances to certain things certain ways. Like we can literally take uh, laser beams. If you've seen uh, Big Bang Theory, you know this. But you can take laser beams and shoot them at mirrors on the moon. And then it bounces back. You can calculate how long it took and compensate for the uh, atmosphere and all that good stuff, uh, which is a very insignificant part. And from that, find out how far the moon is from us. Okay, so that that's that's one way we can do it. We can even do that for say uh, probably the distance between Venus and Earth and the distance between Mars and Earth, uh, and distance from satellites uh, to other planets and so on and so forth. All that can be done with lasers. Uh, we can send radio signals, all sorts of stuff like that. But then once we get further out, there's got to be another way because radar 
uh, signals or radio signals and lasers don't work that well to go that far of a distance. So we step it up a little bit. So we're going to go through like a series of, of ways we can go about measuring things. And in each case, you use what you know about the lower step. So the lower step, for instance, was the step about uh, using uh, lasers to shoot at planets, have them bounce back, or sending radio signals at planets, have them bounce back, that sort of thing. Uh, and that gets us confident about the distances to terrestrial things. What we then do is come up with another way and we use the data from the terrestrial distances that we got with lasers and radio waves and confirm that the method works and then you use that to go further away. And then again, you use that new method uh, to confirm the next method and so on and so forth. So you'll be, you'll be surprised how many uh, ways we've come up with and it's really pretty absurd. But in all of doing that, we also ended up surveying the stars. So we ended up having an idea of, you know, how many stars of which type there are, uh, how, how old they are, really cool stuff. I mean, imagine this is the big, this is the big problem of astronomy that we have solved. Imagine an alien species coming to planet Earth and they get to look at every living creature for a whole second total. So in other words, they can scan the Earth for a whole second and then that's it, okay? And from that, they put together that, you know, each of those humans that they see, you know, down to an infant just about ready to be born inside of its mother up to an old person, instead of thinking there's, you know, several different weird species, they conclude that, oh, these things are living a life cycle where they start off inside of their mother, uh, come out, grow up, grow old, start to shrink again, so on and so forth. Uh, that, that's pretty much what we've done because the second is to you know 100 million years roughly as uh or excuse me one second is to 70 years as about 400 years is to 100 million years which is sort of the minimum time you can observe a star before it starts to die so that's really equivalently to what we've done so we're going to learn that and it's kind of interesting and I'll, and I'll point out to you how we did that so one of the first things uh, you notice uh, about Orion is hopefully y'all can see it now. I even saw it last night. It was starting to get cloudy, but I could still see the belt of Orion. I could see Betelgeuse and, Ar and Rigel. And if you remember early on, the story about Betelgeuse and Rigel was that Betelgeuse was thought to be the brightest one and Rigel was thought to be the second one. But you can also see, see all this red way out here and then here and here? That's all nebula. That, that all that color that you see there is all nebula and these brightest of stars all seem to have come from that same nebula. So yes, they're different distances away from us, but the distance between say uh, this one and this one compared to the distance between us and this one or us and that one is insignificant. So when we look at these brightest stars in Orion, they are essentially the same distance away. So when we compare brightnesses, which is how they appear from here, we are actually com comparing luminosities because the only difference between brightness and luminosity is the brightness is the luminosity divided by four pi times the distance away from a squared. Because you got to remember uh, that light, that radiation from that particular star is going to go off equally in every direction because it's roughly spherical. And it's going to have to enclose uh, or cover each square meter of a giant sphere whose center is it and whose edge is right on us with the same amount of radiation. That amount of radiation per unit area is basically that luminosity, which is the total energy divided by the area of that sphere and the area of that square, that sphere is four pi d squared. So we are actually at, uh, measuring luminosities when we look at these two stars. And we were confused for a while that this one was brighter, Betelgeuse was brighter than Rigel. That tells us something. That tells us they have essentially the same luminosity. And as I've told you numerous times before, uh, the general rule is when you look at stars, you see red ones that are really, really dim and you see blue ones that are really, really bright. And then every now and then you see a red one that's bright. That red one's an anomaly. Uh, it's low temperature, yet it has a huge amount of radiation output. So from uh, Stefan Boltzmann law, we know there's only two ways to increase the luminosity of a star. You either increase the temperature or you increase the diameter. So to make up for this one being so many more times hotter than that one, which by the way goes like T to the fourth, uh, compared to this one, this distance must be huge. And that's how we know Betelgeuse is so big. So that's, that's a neat little story all by itself. 
Uh, you can actually see in this photograph the, how many stars there really are. I mean, look at, look at the number of stars you see around Orion and then how big the Great Orion Nebula really is. And then, you know, there's a little part of it and there's another part of it. And there's, you know, there's two major nebulas here. Uh, it's sort of an arguing point as to whether you call them two separate ones or just one big one, but either way. So that's an interesting thing. And I hope you all are looking for this constellation because remember this front foot star is part of the winter circle or the winter polygon or the winter football. Seven ridiculous astronomers caught colds peering at planets gives us the names of those stars. Seven for Sirius and uh, Canis Major, Ridiculous for Rigel and Orion, uh, astronomers for Aldebaran and Taurus the Bull, Cult for Capella and Auriga, Colds Peering for Castor and Pollux and Gemini, and Planets at Planets for Procyon and Canis Minor. Okay, and Procyon means before the dog, so that literally happened to be a constellation, our star, that did its heliacal rising about two weeks before Sirius, which gave the ancient Egyptians a chance to, you know, deal with their crops before the flood because they knew the heliacal rising of, of uh, Rigel was the day that the floods actually occurred on the Nile. So a lot of neat little information there. Go out, look for this. Uh, first, look for the giant circle or football shape in the, in the sky of the brightest stars you can see. I see them in the uh, south, uh, southeast roughly around eight or nine o'clock at night. And Usually, depending on how what time you're out, usually uh, Rigel is uh, probably the second lowest star. The other, the lowest one's usually Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky. So, what is the uh, actual brightness of stars? How do we learn anything about stars when we all when we all, uh, when all we can collect is light? How do we declassify? How do we classify stars? And what are the determining factors of luminosity, temperature, and size? We've learned really all this stuff. Now we're gonna put it to application and, and make use of it. And that's what the rest of the semester is about. That's why I give a robust midterm after chapter six, because uh, chapter six is sort of the last of the chapters where you're really learning some uh, science. Chapter seven you are as well, but that's a little different science. Uh, so let's go. So astronomers measure stellar distance, brightness, and luminosity. It's necessary to understand the mathematics and the physics of light in order to understand stars. Uh, we, we know that. We know about Dean's law. We know about the Stefan Boltzmann law. Uh, we know, you know, how brightness de decreases with distance away by that very luminosity uh, and brightness formula. So one of the ways we can use after we get outside of our uh, immediate solar system where we can use laser beams and, and radio signals to bounce off other planets and objects, once we get beyond that distance where we can't actually use that method anymore, the next method we use is called uh, stereoscopic vision, which in incorporates what we call uh, parallax. So, if, and you should do this. I've asked, I always ask my students to do this. So you should do this as well. Uh, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to be able to uh, take and hold one finger in front of your face out at a distance and close your left eye. Everybody do it. Just stick your arm out as far as possible so that'll, that'll be a little bit less big of a jolt, okay? And then close your left eye and open your right eye. And you'll see that your, your finger moved a little bit against the background. Now do it again with your eye, I mean with your finger fairly close to your eyes and you'll see that your finger moves really, really far from one side of the background to the other side. Like when I do it, I, I'm, I'm sitting on a, a desk that's made out of a folded ping pong table because I'm that classy. Uh, when I do it, I look through my right eye and I see my index finger lined up with the center line of my ping pong table. When I look through my left eye, again, when it's far away, I see it move about what looks like about eight inches uh, on the actual ping pong table, which is maybe you know four feet away from my finger. Now, if I pull it towards me, now when I look through my right eye, I again see my finger uh, covering up the center line of the ping pong table. But when I do it with my left eye, now I see it's off beyond the edge of the ping pong table a good two feet past it. So what that shows you is the bigger the angle of parallax. In other words, the larger the angle that something moves, the closer it is. So that's definitely a what? Thumbs up, thumbs up or a thumbs up, thumbs down relationship. Anyone? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yes, it's thumbs up, thumbs down. I don't know where this thing went. So yeah, when I had my finger like this, my camera was off, so 
all the cool stuff I was doing, and, and I was juggling. There was lights and lasers and flames. Well, and now I'm disappointed I didn't wow. get to now, see that. I know. I mean, Seriously, that good. you need to record I mean, I completely that. Missed it. And now I've burned up all my stuff. So, yeah, I did this with my finger really far away, and it moved about eight inches when I went from this eye, from this eye to that eye. But then when I did this, it moved from here to way over there. So right there to there. So that was a really big angle because it's close to me. So when it was close to me, I saw it made a big angle. When it's far from me, I saw it made a small angle. So that's what we call parallax measurement. And it's because of quote unquote stereoscopic vision that we can do that because we had two eyes. Now, if you lost an eye or blind in one eye, perhaps from a NASCAR race or whatever, then obviously you don't have stereoscopic vision. And that was why I had such a hard time getting back into the uh, NASCAR circuit after his bad wreck. Uh, Earnhardt. Uh, it was Earnhardt, right? Yeah, I think so. I don't watch NASCAR. But anyways, stereoscopic vision is helpful. It gives us 3D vision. So by having two eyes, we actually see depth and stuff. But in terms of a planet, if we're on planet Earth and we're over here, say, in June around the sun, here's the sun, then in December, we're way over here. So it's as if we got eyeballs that are two astronomical units apart. So that's a really big deal, right? So if we aim our telescope in, in say December, okay, at some star, and then we do it again in June at that same set of stars, what we'll see is one of those stars, the closest one, will have moved say to the right of one of the more distant stars and by a very specific amount. And that angle that it's moved by, if we measure that in arc seconds, turns out that if I divide one by that measure in arc seconds, I get the distance we define as the parsec. See how it says parsec, parallax second? So that's the whole origin. We, we defined the unit parsec specifically because we wanted it to be, when you look at something uh, across basically two astronomical units, the parallax angle, by the way, and that is just one, uh, uh, or the, the parallax distance, and that is just one AU, even though we're doing a double thing. But the parallax angle is basically uh, the angle across one of those. When we do that, that's a distance that we see. If it's actually one arc second between here and here, then we measure that distance to be one parsec. So if we measure it to be uh, two arc seconds, then it's going to be one divided by two or half a parsec. If we measure it to be one tenth of a, of a parsec, then it'll be one divided by one tenth, which is 10 parsecs. Okay. So it's a simple formula D equals one over the parallax angle. As long as you're using parsecs and uh, uh, arc seconds of parallax, it's automatically done. So there's no constants in it or anything like that. So that is a quote unquote another equation you got to use. But all you got to do is whichever one I give you, because I'm not going to make you convert or anything like that. I'll give it to you in the unit you need. So if I give you parallax uh, seconds, arc seconds, then you divide one by it, and that'll give you the distance in, par in parsecs. If I give you a certain number of parsecs, you divide you divide one by that number of parsecs, and that'll give you the, the arc seconds. Okay, easiest equation that we use. But that is our next step on the ladder. So the first step of the ladder, like I said, was Laser, lasers and, and radio waves bouncing off of things. The next one is the parallax. Uh, it turns out we are limited, of course. We can't measure, but for so small of a parallax angle. And that only gets us to on the order of, uh, I think it's around 100 to, to 500 uh, light years away. So we got to go beyond that and actually look for another way uh, once we get there. So let's go back to our slab. So that's parallax. That's how that works. And I think it makes some sense to you now, hopefully. Okay, let's see, okay, now. So for instance, what we're seeing here is this little angle here, this half angle, that's the actual parallax angle. That's why I said two astronomical units just gives you one, uh, one measure of, of uh, parallax. So anyways, uh, if, if this angle happened to be two arc seconds, then this distance to this star right here would be one parsec, okay? So comparing the position six months apart, you get two AU, uh, and then of course you can figure out distances. The parallax is a change in apparent position that results from a change in the position of the observer. If you've ever seen, uh, like what I'm used to seeing it on is multimeters, uh, little analog meters. Uh, speedometers is another one that would be nice, but they never do it. But if you look at like a little multimeter, it will have 
these numbers going across in an arch and it has a little needle, but it's got a little mirror behind it. So if you look over here, you get to see the needle and the reflection of the needle in the mirror next to it. But if you slowly force yourself to get lined up just perfectly, then the image of the needle and the needle line up, and then you know you're looking at it straight on so you can get an accurate measurement. So that's another parallax phenomenon. If you if you look at your speedometer, you know, you're driving like this, you're sitting over here like this, and you're looking at your speedometer. Well, that's going to suggest your speedometer uh, or your speedometer is suggesting to you that you might be going 55 when, in fact, if you line up right here, you find out you're going 60. And if you're laying over here, that would actually give you a safety factor. So lean against your girl instead or your guy or whatever. OK, <laughs> anyways, so the only direct uh, way to measure the distance to a star is from parallax. So that's sort of the, the most reliable and accurate. The problem is we are limited to how far we can see. Uh, one arc second, remember, one arc minute is 1 60th of a degree, just like one minute is 1 60th of an hour. And then one arc second is 1 60th of a minute. So one arc second is 160 times 60 or 136 hundredth of a degree. So a parsec is, uh, or excuse me, an arc second is a really, really small, small, small measure. So this is what I was talking about. Notice this is one arc second right here from the line connecting the sun uh, and the line connecting the earth. Still, we define this to be two parsecs and this to be one parsec. OK, so the half an arc second is really where we get the parsec. You can work out the geometry on it, but the big deal is you don't. I don't I don't need you to do that. I just need you to understand that the bigger the uh, arc second measure, the smaller the distance away from us. OK, and maybe I'll even ask you to use equation, which is really, you know, one divided by whatever I give you. OK. Now, the parallax angles are me measured for uh, more than 1 billion stars. So we actually have measured the distances to uh, basically a billion stars. Uh, so we're pretty confident about that. And that's a direct measurement. That's as direct as going out and surveying uh, like you do for land uh, as a surveyor and stuff like that. So it's really, really very precise. It's precise in the sense that it has error but we know exactly how much error is reasonable for it to have. So if we say something is this distance plus or minus this, then we know it's definitely no smaller than this and no larger than that. And we can take that into account whenever we go to try to use it to calibrate our next type of measurement. So uh, attaining distance is essential to determining the intrinsic brightness of a star. Remember brightness, as I told you before, is the total power output divided by the total area it's put out on. So if a star is D away from us, then that star is uh, basically saturating the surface of a sphere whose radius is the distance from the star to us. And each square meter of that sphere has about the same amount of light going through it as a result of the luminosity of the star. So the brightness that hits us is basically the measure of that luminosity divided by the area. So if we have a little meter uh, uh, CCD camera like this, we calculate this little area and we take that uh, energy it, it absorbed and we take that energy and divide it by the area, that gives us the brightness. And then if we knew the distance away, we could then multiply by four pi d squared to get the actual luminosity. Again, I'm not making you do any of those calculations. I just want you to understand where it comes from. Uh, so the big deal is, you know, a 100 watt light bulb has a luminosity of 100 watts. Now, like I said, the majority of that is not visible light. It's actually heat and stuff like that. So that's why incandescent lights are not that efficient. Fluorescent lights are way better, blah, 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 right? But here's the deal. If you take a 100 watt light bulb and you put it right here, it's going to burn your eye, right? It actually will, you know, harm your eye and make you see red spots for a while. But if you put a 100 watt light bulb, you know, a mile away, it's not that big a deal. That's the same thing with stars. If a star looks really bright in the sky, it might be because it's super, super bright, in the, like in the case of Rigel, or it might be because it's super, super close to us, which is the case for our sun. So that's the big deal. There's the formula. Luminosity is 4 pi distance to the star squared times brightness. But the main thing is, once I know the brightness and one other thing, either distance or luminosity, I can find the other. 
So if I'm lucky enough to find something who we know some physical principles about, like uh, uh, a C-field variable, a C-field variable has a very specific luminosity based on its period. So if we can find the period at which its brightness does this back and forth, we can throw that in this equation that's been discovered. That tells us the luminosity. So for that C-field variable, we now know luminosity and brightness. So we can use that to solve for the distance away. So that's another way we could actually figure out the distance to a planet and we can check it versus parsecs, you know, basically versus the parallax angles that we've done. So all we need to do is find the CPID variable that happens to be in that billion of stars we've measured the arc second from. And we can use that to calibrate, make sure our formula works that we came up with or that Henry Swan, Le uh, Henrietta Swan Levitt came up with regarding CPID variables. So uh, the luminosity usually is expressed in terms of the solar luminosity. Uh, it turns out there's a pretty large range. So we end up using uh, a lot of what we call logarithmic scales. Logarithmic scales weird. Like if you go one distance up, you get to one. And if you go up twice as far, you normally get to two. But in the logarithmic scale, you go from one here to 10 to 100 to 1,000. So each time you go up by a factor of 10, that's what's useful for a logarithmic scale. So logarithmic scales can be used to, uh, one, test whether something's an exponential decay, or two, more importantly, to fit a buttload of data in a small amount of range because it allows you to go from uh, 10 to the negative 6 all the way up to 10 to the 6 and, you know, like 12 inches. So uh, that's a lot of it. So it turns out when you actually do this luminosity, uh, if you look at the relative number of stars we've looked at and measured the luminosity from, the luminosity, uh, a, a lot of them are really, 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 really uh, cr close to the luminosity of our sun. And then as you get basically higher and higher luminosities, as this graph goes to the right, notice the relative number of stars get smaller and smaller so that, uh, if you say 10 to the negative six, this appears to be, let's say it's halfway between 10 to the negative six, which is one one millionth, and 10 to the negative seventh, which is uh, one uh, 10 millionth. So maybe we'd say it's one 500 millionth. So, uh, or excuse me, one five millionth. So one five millionth as many stars uh, are 10 to the six luminosities as are one solar luminosity. So we see that the bigger uh, or the higher the luminosity of a star gets, the less of them there are. And in fact, the lower the luminosity a uh, star gets, the more there are. Okay. And it seems like we're pretty close to the maximum, but in fact, uh, 10 to the negative fourth solar lumens is really the maximum. So the vast majority of stars uh, are in between 10 to the negative fourth and one solar lumens, okay? The Stefan-Boltzmann law, again, tells us that uh, a star can be bright by two ways, either high temperature, because luminosity and temperature are thumbs up, thumbs up, by T to the fourth. So if I double the temperature of a star, it doesn't go up by two, which would be two to the one, or four, which is two to the two, or eight, which is two to the three, but by 16, which is two to the four. So that's a big deal. And it's also thumbs up, thumbs up with uh, basically the, su the surface area, or if you assume they're spheres, and that's not that, I mean, that's a great assumption for the vast majority of them, but it's not always a great assumption. But if you assume it's uh, a sphere, then it goes like the distance squared, uh, or excuse me, the diameter squared or the radius squared. So if I double the diameter or radius, I actually increase the luminosity not by two, but by two squared, which is four. Okay. There's the Dean's law, and this is a way we can actually use it to determine uh, the actual temperature of a star that we see. So if we look at a star and we make it spectra, remember the spectra is that steep graph, comes to a peak and then gradually falls back down. If we can find the wavelength at which that peak occurs, we can just divide 2.9 million nanometers times Kelvin by that wavelength, and that'll give us a temperature. 
And I've told you that's that's the way they put that gun against your forehead nowadays and, and actually measure your temperature. Or if they're even the one that they just hold in front of you and don't even have to touch your head, they're using Beam's Law. It, it's more or less like that electronics is creating a spectra for you, finding where your peak occurs. And it's actually easier to do it this way with the peak, uh, with Beam's Law uh, for a thermometer. Finding where the peak is, using Beam's Law to compute your temperature, and then, you know, doing some biological correction because they know, you know, a person that measures this temperature on the forehead is more likely to be this much warmer inside their you know bum, which is where they really want to take temperature of. So that's uh, another interesting tidbit from astronomy that helps us in everyday life. So you notice there's the peak like on this graph. So that peak, if I knew that wavelength, it appears to be in the green. If I divided 2.9 million, assuming this was in nanometers, then that would give, if I divided 2.9 million nanometers kelvin by that wavelength uh in nanometers then that would give me the temperature of the surface of that planet or star or whatever in kelvin but as you can see this is the typical spectra that you really get from a star because remember this is a black body radiation this is from a hot dense object that Planck uh derived but in the case of a star you've got a hot dense object the core blowing out radiation and then that radiation bits are stolen from it as it goes through its outer atmosphere the star so you get this sort of the same curve but it's got all these holes in it as you can tell this graph is actually one of the better ones it looks kind of pretty it almost looks like the same shape but you can see there would be some error in trying to locate exactly where this peak is just because how jagged it is so it turns out that Beam's law is not that uh, not as accurate or precise for us determining temperatures as some other ways that we'll learn later. If you're actually looking at emission spectra, you can tell it's even worse because then all you have is the spikes without the curve with the holes. See, the curve with the holes is much more obvious than the spikes without the curve. So the emission spectra is even worse. And remember, emission spectra happens when the electron falls down, when the arrow points down. OK, so uh, the spectrum is the amount of light emitted as a function of wavelength. When uh, any jump cannon and Cecilia Payne and some of these other brilliant women that we called the computers, uh, when they worked for Ed Edward Pickering, uh, they in fact you know, referred to them as Pickering's harem or whatever. Uh, it turns out he, he was at Harvard and what happened was he's a typical PhD doctorate advisor in that he doesn't show a lot of respect to a lot of people because they think they're so great. Uh, and in, in some cases they are, but still, you don't have to be mean to people. Uh, so he was complaining about one of his uh, grad students being an idiot, uh, not being able to analyze these spectra. He was looking at stars and he would look at them and he told this grad student, he said, my deaf housekeeper could do a better job at this than you. And then to so th uh, throw more salt on the wound, he brought in his deaf housekeeper. And she, in fact, turned out really freaking awesome. By the end of her life, she had, uh, she had actually uh, characterized, i.e. given the spectral classification of uh, over half a million stars. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, she was Annie Jump Cannon, but she might have been the other uh, one of the other ones. She's not Cecilia Payne, I know that. Uh, but these women were really super awesome. They worked all together. This was around the time of World War I, so uh, the men that were around to do stuff like graduate work were either enfeebled by, you know, some kind of horrible injury or birth defect or something like that, or they were just wealthy enough to skip the draft. So uh, they got out scot-free, uh, but that left a big workforce available to us via women. So these women came in and were referred to us as computer. Well, they were making up the system of letters where they would classify certain parameters as uh, having an A-class star, and then other parameters would be a B-class, and another would be a C-class. And you can imagine they'd use like the whole alphabet. Well, when it was all said and done, Cecilia Payne did her uh, PhD thesis and she basically made a big enough prediction to have won a Nobel Prize, but her PhD advisor told her, poor, you know, you poor soul uh, female, she don't know what she's talking about because there's clearly not that much helium and hydrogen in the universe. And uh, it turned out he was wrong. She was right. And he did give her credit after the fact, but she went at the very end of her thesis, which is perfect. I mean, they used it for a textbook for stellar atmospheres for decades. 
uh, at the very end of it, it says, yet I must be wrong. Just, just because that guy told her that. So that was kind of a bummer. And she didn't blame him. She said, you know, I should have stuck to my guns. Well, when all that was said and done, we ended up understanding what these classifications were. This uh, system ended up getting rid of all the letters except for O, B, A, F, G, K, M. And the mnemonic I use for that is the mnemonic that many people have used for it, but you can make up your own. It's O, B, A, Fine Girl, Kiss Me. Uh, obviously, you could replace that with a fine guy if you so desire. But O, O, B, A, Fine Girl, Kiss Me. The O is the hottest, the B is the second hottest, the A's are the third, F's are the fourth, so on and so forth. And that's the classifications, okay? We found out that wasn't fine-tuned enough, so we then added the uh, number classification after it. So you, you could have an O0 star, which is the hottest of the hot, all the way down to an O9 star, which is the coldest of the hottest, okay? Then you go B0, which would be the hottest of the second hottest, down to B9, which is the coldest of the second hottest, and so on and so forth. So you should know that classification. You should be able to tell me which is hotter, uh, O5 or an O8, which is hotter, uh, O0 or an A9, which is hotter, uh, O0 or an A0, uh, B9 or an A0, all that sort of stuff, okay? But I don't need you to know these individual ranges. So that whole thing, that whole uh, computers taking over stuff, they, they got a lot of astronomy done in the early 1900s, uh, like I said, during World War I. Uh, but it later turned out that these classifications could be made other ways as well. As you see the little dark lines in there, these are all stellar spectra. And stellar spectra, I told you, are absorption spectra. Or excuse me, yeah, absorption spectra. So they're dark line spectra. So you see that, you know, this group right here has these three lines very prominently. Actually, you might even say all of these lines very prominently. Well, it turns out that uh, quantum mechanically speaking, a certain element, say hydrogen, has a, a really ideal range where it can give off its spectra. In other words, it can flip back and forth because if hydrogen is too hot, then it has no electrons whatsoever attached to its nucleus. So there's no way in heck you're going to get an electron to fall, say, or to jump from the zeroth level up to the second level or the third or so on and so forth, because there's no electrons attached. That's when it's too hot. When it's too cold, then all your electrons are down at the very bottom, the very lowest level possible. And the chance of it going from the second level to the third level, which might be the one that you can see, is very, very nil. In other words, there's very little chance of it. So there's this narrow temperature band where each particular line of each particular element or compound is very prominent. So it turns out the better way to check temperature isn't with Wien's law. A lot of times, if we can do it, we do it with, uh, well, it has you know hydrogen and hydrogen is between 10,000 and 18,000 Kelvin. So I know uh, those dark lines tell me that the temperature of the stars between 10,000 and 8,000 Kelvin. Yay, that's good, right? But then you find, oh, there's this other molecule, and that's between 16,000 and 18,000. So now I've got it narrowed down to between 16,000 and 18,000. And you can keep doing that, and that range will get smaller and smaller. And we can actually get temperatures very, very accurately now. We can get temperatures uh, on the order of a few Kelvin difference. Uh, so that's the way we do it modernly now. But sometimes you just don't have the full capacity to do all that. You have to sort of guess where that peak is. Uh, calculate uh, Bean's law to determine temperature and so on and so forth. Uh, as I said, the O's are the hottest and the M are the coldest and the M's uh, so cold that you actually get molecules forming. So you can see lines for, like I said, titanium oxide, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, water vapor, stuff like that. Well, maybe not water vapor, but anyways, uh, you, can, you can see molecules even, okay? Uh, temperature is uh, measured by the color index. So this this is also the spectral type is like a color index as well. Uh, so you can see the higher the, the letter, the O or the zero, uh, the higher you are in that scale, the hotter it is. The, heart, the hottest stars have weak absorption lines by hydrogen. So if you look up here, the hydrogen spectra would probably be, let's say around it's, uh, we know it's this red and this blue and stuff like that. When you get up here, you don't see any of those lines from hydrogen. That's because the temperature is so high, the electrons are gone. They're not in there. They're not making any transitions. But when you get to a lower level, then you can start getting all these lines and you know, oh, okay, this must be the hydrogen realm. So that's another way, like I said, we can classify these things. 
the medium hot stars have a uh, strong absorption line. So that's the A stars. Uh, so you can see, see how intense these look right here. And they're starting to trail off this way and starting to trail off this way. These could be, for instance, the hydrogen lines. And actually a couple of them are. Uh, and, and for that reason, we know the, the hydrogen will be most prevalent in type A stars. And the coolest uh, have absorptions of heavy elements by heavy elements. And that's type M. So this is the relative abundance of what's in there. Remember, I, we can take the dips, how deep those uh, depressions are in the actual black body curve. And the deeper ones mean there's more of that element present or that compound present. And the shallow ones mean there's less. That's how we get numbers like this percentages of atoms versus percentage of the sun's mass, so on and so forth. As you can see, nothing, nothing earth shattering here. We're still mostly hydrogen and helium. If you add those two, you're up around 98. 0.2%. So 98.2% still hydrogen and helium, but all those other things are in there as well in small amounts. Uh, uh, as we said, the Stefan Boltzmann law can help us find uh, luminosity if we have the distance, or it can help us find, uh, or excuse me, I should say, if we have the temperature and the surface area, we should be able to calculate the luminosity. Once we have the luminosity and we have the brightness, we could use that to determine the distance away. Uh, another thing that can help us a lot uh, with stars is, okay, I've told you how we can come up with luminosity. I told you how we can come up with temperature, but how do we come up with the mass of stars? Well, it just so happens the vast majority of star systems form not with single stars, but with multiple stars. In other words, clusters are way more common than, you know, single star solar systems like we have. So if you have two stars that are actually orbiting one another, what, what happens if they're about the same size, then they will orbit a, a single center of mass. That's what this little X is, right? And the way that works is uh, the larger one uh, will actually uh, go a lot further distance and the smaller one will stay closer by, but they always have to be on opposite sides of the center of mass or they're not center of mass. So this star and this star always make a line that goes right through the spot, even here, see? So but, but what you see in that is right here, the blue one's here and the red one's here. And then you get the blue one uh, here and the red one here. And then you get the red one back where it was and the blue one went back where it was. And they did exactly one rotation. So the periods of these two stars are uh, orbit is exactly the same. So, so that helps you, you can use Kepler's third law for the period and distance relationship. Uh, and you can use that to help you find the mass. Uh, you can also, of course, you know, there's two unknowns here. There's the mass of star one and the mass of star two. So instead of just having, uh, you know, the factor that Newton showed us with just the mass of the sun, when you're dealing with things that are comparable to the mass of the actual star you're talking about, you'll have a sum of masses like M1 and M2. Well, the ratio of the distances from the center of mass to the star for each of the stars is related to their size, is related to their mass. So that's one equation that can help you get it. And what you see, of course, is the uh, larger star is closer to the center of mass and the smaller star, the less massive one, is farther from the center of mass. I think I said that backwards a second ago. Uh, just make sure you notice that. So yeah, the, the small star is gonna do this itty bitty orbit and the uh, big star is going through this big orbit. And if you see this distance is actually, let's say three, uh, one third as long as this one, then you know that this star is three times as massive as that star. So that's one equation. And then we got Kepler's third law, the periods are equal. All you got to do is find one of the semi-major axes and then that'll give you another equation for the two masses. You can combine those and find the masses. So that's the way we can determine masses of stars. Uh, it turns out when we measure these stars, it turns out that stars range from 0.08 solar masses, about 8% of uh, the mass of the sun, up to about 150 solar masses. We, we don't really find stars smaller or bigger than that. So that's, that's a pretty good range. If I remember correctly, I think, uh, I think the mass of our sun, or excuse me, of Jupiter is I want to say, for some reason, the number keeps jumping up at me. You can do this calculation yourself if you want. But I think that's about 64 times the mass of uh, Jupiter. So if Jupiter got 64 times heavier or something like that, I'll double check on that calculation. But it's Jupiter's uh, not that far away from it. Let's say that. So that's what's making me think I might be wrong about the 64, but the 64 stuck in my head. 
But either way, what you know is 0.08 or 8% of the mass of the sun is the, sort of the minimum temperature that our minimum uh, mass that must happen for a star to be a star. And we have some theoretical reasons to suggest this is the right number, uh, but we have a few outlying pieces of data that suggest there are instances where stars are bigger than 150 solar masses. So that's an ongoing area of research, but that gives you some range. You know, we found that the range of the uh, luminosities of stars goes all the way to 10 to the negative fourth and all the way up to 10 to the six times the solar luminosity. So one ten thousandth luminosity of the sun to a million times as luminous as the sun. Now we found that uh, the mass of the stars can go from 8% of the mass of the sun to 150 times the mass of the sun. So we're building this little uh, piece of data or sets of data that gives us a survey of what the stars are around us. And when we find out that there's a certain number, a certain fraction of all the stars we find is in the 0.08 to 0.09 category. Uh, and then another one from 0.09 to 1 or 0.1 and so on and so forth, you can start to get probabilities of, of how many stars are in each mass range. And that can give you an overall idea what the average star's mass is and stuff of that sort. Uh, here's another way you can actually use to determine the mass of a star uh, or multiple stars. If they're actually, if we're lucky enough to have them orbiting in the same plane as we see, then what we'll see is two stars. Uh, one might have really uh, broad spectral lines, meaning that there's a lot of collisions going on. So that might be a, a small dense star. Uh, other ones might have very crisp lines, and that would mean that it's so uh, massive, so large, that it's low density on the outside, so atoms are not running into each other. So the, the lines are very pristine for exactly the orbits of the uh, various electrons in the atom. And you can see those two lines flip back and forth. You know, they literally line up where one's blocking the other and you'll get the bigger of the two. And then you see them shifted to the other side. So you see a red shift, blue shift, rip shift, roof shift. You can plot that shift on a graph and get this nice little sine curve. That sine curve can allow you to determine the period of rotation or the period of orbit of the, the objects. And then again, uh, you know that the two orbital periods have to be the same. Uh, but you can now use that to help you figure out the distance by knowing how far away it is. And then the angular measure in the telescope tells you how far it is based on how far away it is. So again, that helps us find this. We found numerous binary stars like that. For, us, for instance, Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B. Uh, th those are the two nearest stars to us. Uh, they're about 1.4 arc seconds apart. So 1.4, 36, uh, 36 hundredths of a, of a degree apart. Uh, but because they're next to each other, we can quickly determine their masses and they're orbiting. You know, they're, they're literally one orbiting the center of mass while the other one's on, uh, also orbiting the center of mass, but on the opposite side of it. And uh, that's why we, you know, sometimes say Alpha Centauri is the bright or the nearest star to us other than our sun. But sometimes you'll hear people say uh, Beta Centauri or something like that, because there's actually uh, is a, a, it's a group of stars there, I should say. Um, so it's Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B is the actual system, not Beta, I'm sorry. So, so are they are they orbiting each other or are so so at some point they're going to end up colliding and uh, not necessarily. And in fact, they might be close enough where they might become one of these cool systems we'll learn about. They orbit each other for a long time, but the, the more massive one will die quicker. And when it dies, it goes through this process where it'll expand. And if it expands far enough, it actually will get into the Roche limit of the other star. And that other star can actually suck material onto it. And that star can start to grow bigger and this star can stop, stop aging. So they can last for very long times and that can go back and forth, back and forth. So there's no real reason uh, for them to necessarily collide uh, unless they really, I mean, get to the end where they can't, one's overcome so much that it's never going to be able to give up its mass like one becomes a black hole. That's what we think uh, how black holes start or binary black hole coalescence starts. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Okay. Yeah, there's it, it some pretty cool stuff. Like I said, we found uh, 
black holes with stars orbiting it. We've had black holes with white dwarfs next to it, white dwarfs orbiting white dwarfs. We found the really weird thing is we found uh, white dwarfs uh, uh, actually orbiting a uh, very high mass star. And by the age of it, the white dwarf should be this really, really old star, but yet they're here at the same time. And we got this super massive star that should live way less time than the white dwarf star did, yet it's alive and not even in its end stages. And we figured that out by basically realizing that there's a mass transfer between the two. So it, it's some neat anomalies that occur. Uh, if you have an eclipsing binary, you can also use that because the uh, basically both stars contribute to the brightness. So anytime one star gets in front of the other, you're going to get a dip in brightness. Obviously, this big star is much brighter than this little star. So when the little star goes in front, you lose a little bit of brightness. But when the big star goes in front, you lose a lot of brightness. And then the next line is this. So this from here to here is one period of the orbit. So that's for an eclipsing binary. Uh, all these allow us to determine ultimately, you know, the masses of stars. And, and we find out that there's a lot of groups of stars as opposed to just plain star systems with one star in it like we're used to. So what we were able to put together from all this is we, we, it turns out that, like I said, there's a buttload of red stars that are not very bright. And generally speaking, as you go from red to orange to yellow to green to blue to indigo to violet, uh, they get brighter and brighter and brighter. So if you make a plot of luminosity, which in our case, we're actually literally talking luminosity, not just brightness, okay? If you make a plot of luminosity on the vertical scale and then temperature on the horizontal scale, but here's the weird thing, you're actually doing uh, uh, wavelength thing here as opposed to a temperature and because of that it's backwards okay because low wavelength means high temperature so uh this is the uh low temperature in which would be the high wavelength in so it's kind of this weird thing where notice the numbers are getting bigger going right to left uh so what you find out is like i said most of the low temperature stars have low luminosity hence they end up here and then the higher the temperature goes the higher the luminosity goes, and that's called the main sequence, okay? Turns out all these stars are fusing hydrogen into helium in their core. That's majorly the, the source of energy. Other little reactions can occur, but the major source of energy is ha fusing hydrogen into helium. However, when these stars begin their death knell, they end up burning other things. So they run out of hydrogen in the core. They've got a big heaping core of nothing but helium, essentially. Gravity will win for a split second because the actual core is not putting up enough radiation to keep gravity at bay. So gravity squishes down on the helium core. If gravity is sufficient enough, then that will make the core reach the uh, critical 100 million Kelvin. And at 100 million Kelvin instead of 10 million Kelvin, which is what you need for just hydrogen and the helium fusion, at 100 million Kelvin, if I, I'm pretty sure that's the figure, uh, carbon is actually formed from helium. In other words, helium will start uh, fusing with other helium to form carbon. And that outer ring on the outside that's maybe uh, is mostly uh, helium, but it still has some hydrogen in it because it was you know, part of the star. Well, that might reignite and start burning uh, hydrogen into helium around on a little disc shape around it, or, or not a disc shape, but a, a spherical, uh, spherical surface, if you will, um, thinking like a mm, spherical shell. That's that's the word I was going for, shell. So there's a spherical shell fusing uh, hydrogen and the helium around it, and then there's a, a helium core fusing helium into carbon inside that. And then the same thing will happen again. Each of these are happening successively quicker, by the way. If it happens again and you run out of uh, helium in the core, the next step is carbon fusing into something else and some other elements fusing, and it'll keep growing and growing and growing and you end up getting this sort of gobstopper thing where each layer has a separate type of fusion going on. And then if it's still massive enough, it'll explode in a supernova and it's created all these wonderful elements. Uh, and then of course the supernova creates the rest of the elements that we've seen on the periodic table. So it's kind of amazing. But when that process starts, they leave this main sequence. They start taking little trips over here and going over here and then looping back around here. That's called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. 
HR diagram because a guy by the name of Hertzsprung and another guy by the name of uh, Russell both came up with this simultaneously in different sides of the globe, or not, I shouldn't say different sides, they're different ends of a continent. Uh, and in doing so, uh, they came up with a new way of classifying stars. So if you notice here, the Stefan Boltzmann law requires a definite relationship between luminosity, temperature, and uh, size. So if you actually plot uh, lines of constant radius, they become these little lines. So see these little dotted lines? So this is kind of nice. If you find a main sequence star and you know its temperature, you just put it on the Hertzsprung-Russell di diagram. If you know it's a main sequence star, then you know it's on the main sequence. So you now got its luminosity. And because you have its luminosity and, uh, and its temperature, you know exactly where it is on this graph. So you can tell what its radius is. This one, for instance, is our sun. It'll have a radius of one sun radius. Uh, if you find it's off the main sequence, uh, you can't necessarily conclude what its luminosity would be. So you'd have to have both the luminosity and temperature to do these guys, but you still get the added advantage once you do the luminosity and temperature, you now know that this star has a, ma a radius that's 100 solar radii. This one has a, ra a radius that's 1000 solar radii. And this one up here would have around 10,000 solar radii. So this Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is this wonderful invention that makes perfect sense. It's sort of like a graph of the mass of a car versus the horsepower that it has. Like the vast majority of light cars have really low horsepower, right? And the vast majority of really heavy cars like Mack trucks have a really high horsepower. But then you have this weird thing where these uh, really, really light cars have a buttload of horsepower and uh, those would be like this up here. This would be like a dragster or a funny car or a NASCAR or something like that. And then other ones are really, really heavy cars, uh, but they have very little horsepower. And uh, maybe they're like, you know, your grandfather using an old F-150 to pull uh, twin trailers <laughs> or something like that, right? So the weirdities, the oddities are these things over here and here, but the vast majority of stuff is just reasonable. Like the heavier my car, the more horsepower I'm going to have to give it. In, the, in this case, the hotter my star, the lower the, the more, uh, the higher the luminosity and the colder my star, the lower my luminosity. So that's what the main sequence is. And it's basically main sequence are stars living their midlife. They're basically, you know, uh, living for a certain amount of time based on their mass, how, which forces how fast they uh, burn the fuel. And when you actually get it on this main sequence, there's an added advantage because when we start looking at, at clusters, we find out, you know, clusters are all born about the same instant. So we get all these different mass stars in a cluster and they will all line along the main sequence. And then somewhere along the line, they'll start to peel off which is like I said, you know, when stars start to die, they peel off. What we've seen over time, over the 400 years, is these stars die first, and then these die later, and then these die later, and these die later, and these die. So we figured out that these evidently die young and these die late. And by calibrating that over time, we've realized, and using models to feed it back and forth, we've realized roughly how long stars live. So, when you're on the main sequence, you get the added advantage of finding out the lifetime of the star and the mass of the star. So that's kind of cool. So here's some of those uh, constellation uh, clusters, if you will, star clusters. When you actually plot them, uh, you can see this is like a buttload of stars from one uh, massive cluster. And you can see the ones up here are starting to peel off. And some of them have even made it all the way over to here to the white dwarf stage. So by doing this, we can figure out the paths they go through to get over here, or maybe they come around here, all that sort of stuff. Uh, when we do that calibration, here's how the time goes. These are 0.2 solar masses. These things will live longer than the universe is old. So none of them have even died. 0 0.6, 0 0.8, one solar mass, two solar mass, five solar mass, 10 solar mass, 20, 60 solar mass. So you see now that once you have the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, if you find something on the main sequence, you can, for starters, just use the temperature to get it there. Once you get it there, uh, then you know its radius. You also know its uh, uh, lifetime, how long it will live. And we have a direct relationship that tells us what mass it has from that. So you can then find out the mass of the star as well. 
So knowing a star's spectral type and positional nature of our diagram allows you to know its luminosity and find its distance. So you can, this is what we call spectroscopic parallax. In other words, we're using the properties of the star and the fact that stars uh, have a main sequence, which is really just an equilibrium condition that could possibly occur. We're using those facts to determine how far the star away is. When we do that, we call that spectroscopic parallax, okay? So here's another uh, cluster of stars being born. And you can see, actually, I think this one might just be a, a group of stars. It might not even be the same cluster because it doesn't look like they're peeling off. Uh, maybe they are right here, but yeah, okay. So you can see some of them peel off down here to the subgiants, some I'll pull, peel off to the giants, uh, and then the supergiants up here. These are the luminosity classes. So the main sequence is a V. In fact, our star turns out to be a G2V star. So remember, O, B, a fine girl, kiss me. Our star is a G2. G0 is the hottest of the G. G1 is the next. G2 is the next. So we're the third hottest in the G. Uh, but we're a G2V star, which means we're also on the main sequence. Okay. You could also talk about a, a K5 subgiant, which would be a, a K5 IV. Or a giant, which would be a K53, or a supergiant 1B, or supergiant 1A. Or finally, the last luminosity class is the white dwarf class, which is down here. Remember, these are the hottest of temperatures, yet, despite having such a high temperature, they have a very, very low luminosity. That's because they're microscopic. They are actually the burning core of what's left of a regular star. So when they make that gobstopper and then it explodes, some part of the core will be left, maybe. And if it is, that thing will be smoking hot, like hundreds of Kelvin, hundreds of millions of Kelvin. And it'll slowly burn out because they don't have any more fuel. But for a long time, it's going to be really, really bright and hot. And all that time, it's a main sequence star. So we just, or excuse me, a main sequence. All that time is a white dwarf star. I don't know why I said main sequence. So that's why we call it a WD. So the luminosity classes are... Uh, 1A, 1B for supergiants, 2 uh, would be, uh, 2 and 3 are giants. There's actually a class between 3 and, and 2. Uh, the giants is a, is a 3 star. I, I think they called this a red giant or something like that. It's a 2. And then the subgiants are, are, of course, not quite as uh, luminous as the giants. Uh, so there's, uh, you can see 1A, 1B, 2, 3, 4. V is, uh, and we actually refer to these as uh, Roman numerals. So this is I, A, I, B, I, 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 V, V, and then W, D. So taking the distance of the stars, this is sort of a recap of everything we got. There's the process of science, which is always helpful to read. Uh, you can see Cecilia Payne right here. She just died like in the 19, I want to say she died in the 1990s, I think. Uh, but she was the first person to really give us a, an idea of the uh, reason for these stars behaving differently and having these classifications, mainly that they were temperatures and they related to the uh, stuff they were made of. Uh, here's Henry Nor uh, Norris Russell and Ejnar Hertzsprung. And here's Annie Jump Cannon that I told you about working with, uh, working with Edward Pickering. Later, Cecilia Payne comes from the uh, Great Britain to come study physics in America. They wouldn't let her do such things in Great Britain, oddly enough, even though she was sitting in on classes. Uh, she got quite a good education from that and then came over here and, and became you know, a friggin' brilliant scientist. So uh, there's a lot of neat stuff in this chapter. They remember these things always have the the working it out stuff. So this is a distance equals one over parallax angle uh, problem. This is that equation I told you about. If I give you a parallax angle in arc seconds, which that's the only way I'll give it to you, you don't have to convert units. Then you just divide one by it, and that'll give you the distance. If I give you a distance in parsecs, then you just divide one by it, and that'll give you the parallax angle. Uh, the magnitude system is another way, by the way, so when the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, we plotted luminosity, a solar luminosity, we can also have absolute magnitude over here. That's what they're talking about. So the magnitude is the absolute magnitude, and then there's a uh, relative magnitude, uh, magnitude, which is what we were talking about earlier with brightness. So uh, we're actually plotting on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram the true luminosity and the true absolute magnitude uh, versus the true temperature and the true spectral type. 
and the luminosity class. Remember, spectral type is the OBF angle kiss me, but the luminosity classes are the IA, IB, II, III, IV, and so on and so forth. Okay. But when you look at the actual magnitude system, this is the apparent magnitude. This is more like brightness instead of luminosity. And you see our sun is really the brightest thing. It's at like negative 27. Uh, the full moon is like negative uh, 12, negative 13, something like that. Venus is like negative four. The Jupiter is brightest is like uh, negative three. Sirius is like negative 0.5 or negative one, something like that. Then Polaris, then the naked eye limit is six. So this is all that Hipparchus stuff from zero to six are the magnitudes. It turns out when you actually go and do the math, uh, if you want to do the luminosity of everything, a lot of these things go in the negative because we, we chose the system. And it turned out that the difference between a six star and a, a magnitude one star was a factor of 100, basically. So it ended up being like a logarithmic scale. and. Uh, when you actually apply the math, that forces you to go into the negative realm of exponents to get things like the sun, the full and the moon, and Venus, and even Sirius, which you thought was a you know first magnitude star, turns out to be a negative magnitude star because it's so bright. Uh, that also shows you an eight-inch telescope can only get about magnitude 14, but the Hubble can get a magnitude 30, which is really impressive. That's as dim to us as the sun is bright to us. So that's kind of a impressive thing. Again, these equations, you don't have to do any of this stuff. These are all the math working out. And, and other schools do that. I, I don't do that. And I don't think you guys are getting a weaker course by not doing it. In fact, you're probably getting a harder course uh, because it's a lot easier to just throw away some questions and make them into mathematical ones if you've got the math skills, uh, which can stand up against you know scrutiny. But they don't necessarily learn the concepts, which I think are more important. So does anyone have any questions? Uh, remember our test is next class. So you're not actually gonna report to class. You're just gonna go on to the online test area and take that Respondus test with the Respondus Lockdown Browser. You should already have tried the Respondus Practice Test. If you haven't, do that today. Uh, I will see you guys. Our lab meets at one or does it meet at 1.30? I think it meets at one, right? I will meet yeah, you at one. Thank you. I will meet you guys at one o'clock for lab. It's going to be a fairly short one because I have a dental appointment. Uh, but either way, I will see you then and everybody's free to go. And do not, do not, do not forget your test next time. I'll wait for the last person to leave so I can answer questions. Stop recording. Um, so uh, 